Hey there, everyone. Um, welcome to another um, listening session in our series. And I um, want to open with that. I want to call these, I, I wanted to call these listening sessions. And when I created or I came up with this idea and we gathered the panel and all that and created Facebook events, um, I called it a chat series initially. Um, but it really was intended to be more of a listening series. It's just honestly a little bit of, I don't want to say laziness, but. Um, I ran out of characters. I mean, in listening session took up too many characters. So I just put chat on a lot of the things where we advertised it. Um, and we really intended it to be more of a listening session, particularly, particularly for parents who consider themselves allies and want to learn how to be better allies. And for school professionals, you know, whether you're a teacher, counselor, related service, um, administrator, and I do know that we have now many advocates as well um, tuning in to watch this. Um, because I think, I, I think we all have, have a lot to learn. And I even thought I was, I thought I was a great ally um, and I'm just learning so much more that I didn't know, you know, 10 years ago and seeing things in a different lens. Um, today we'll probably be, get a lot of emotions out of people because um, this is kind of the worst of the worst. This is one of the topics where the rubber really hits the road, as they say, um, as far as being harmful to Black students. Um, we all know that racism is hurtful, but this is one of the ways where I, I think it's the most harmful because it affects them for the rest of their lives. Um, we're going to be talking about discipline. SROs, um, suspensions, arrests. And if you aren't familiar, you, I don't want to throw another acronym out there. An SRO is a school, stands for school resource officer. Um, it's kind of a generic ish term. Some schools use SPO for school police officer, um, some use SSO for school security officer. But um, basically, when you're talking about anyone who works in that profession as a uh, law enforcement type person in a school, we say SRO for school resource officer. Um, and before I turn it over, I just want to give you a little 30 seconds of history in case you don't know. Um, school resource officers are a fairly new concept um, as are zero tolerance policies and they kind of go hand in hand. While both of them existed before the Columbine school shooting, it was the Columbine school shooting that was used as a catalyst to bring in a lot more school resource officers and um, enact these zero tolerance policies where you know any type of weapon was not going to be tolerated, any type of violence. Um, and then the school resource officers were brought in um, really with the goal, there, at least the argument at the time, um, I, I don't claim to know people's true motives, but um, the argument at the time was that these school resource officers were going to prevent the next school shooting, which um, they have not been all that successful at. Um, let's call it what it is. So anyway, um, you're going to be hearing some stories today about all, all kinds of stuff, and um, I hope you listen and learn, and I'll be checking in. I'll be here online, but I will, I'm going to mute myself and then check back in later. I'm going to turn it over to Monique. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. And before we get started, uh, because this is a very uh, serious conversation that we are having and sharing our experiences, and um, it is our hopes that everyone throughout the last couple of sessions that have been very gracious to share resources, to provide information to those that asked, is truly appreciated. Um, but as we've mentioned before, and as Lisa just said, you, uh, most of you use this platform on a daily basis, or this is a this is a place that you visit. And today, and with the conclusion of all of our sessions, we would like those of you uh, that are allies, that are looking to become an ally or a better ally, or you're just someone that wants to just change the way that you think, to listen. There are a number of black and brown, uh, people of color, advocates, speech therapists, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, BCBJs, all of you are on the line that can provide that information that to those that are asking in the group chat, but also 
please share your experiences as well as we um, go through today's listening session. Um, as Lisa mentioned, today's session is suspensions, arrests, and school resource officers. How the school disciplinary system treats black children with disabilities. Uh, we are going to introduce ourselves. Uh, we're just going to give our names and Lisa will post a link if you'd like to know anything additional about us. Uh, I will start off. My name is Monique Duje. Who wants to go next? I will. My name is Safir Jenkins. Hello, everybody. I am Maria Davis Pierre, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Hi, I'm Sharon Scipio. I'm Cheryl Lynn Medina. Hi, I'm Sabra, and a parent of a 22 year old young man. Okay, and as you all, you have met Lisa in the beginning. So we're going to get started. Monique, uh, we lost your video. No, you haven't lost oh, my video. Okay, <laughs> all right. The national culture of marginalizing and policing vulnerable students is pervasive today uh, in the education and the criminal justice systems. And it has ultimately built what is largely referred to as we're here to discuss today, the school to prison pipeline. Um, the school to prison pipeline affects students by pushing them out of school with exclusionary practices and policies around discipline uh, that include suspensions, expelling, and even arresting kids for minor offenses that used to be handled by the principals by the school staff, like a guidance counselor or your school counselor, and even the teacher. But it doesn't end there. The most significant indicator of which children will be suspended is not the type of offense, but the color of their skin, their special education status, what school they go to, what is your zip code? or whether they've been suspended before. So we're gonna start break, breaking down some data as we uh, have this conversation. Uh, Three million students, including preschoolers and kindergartners, yes, preschoolers and kindergartners are suspended from public schools each year nationally. And the, and the rates are increasing dramatically. Um, so if that's happening nationally overall, for children of color with disproportionates, they are also being disproportionately suspended. Um, the United States Department of Education data increases the rise, indicating that African-American students, K through 12, are three times more likely to receive an out-of-school suspension than their white counterparts. 3.8 times more likely. Even though research shows that there's no evidence that the students of color misbehave any more than their white peers or that the infraction is different. Now, much of the research is focused on expulsions and suspensions in elementary school, middle and high school settings. But there is evidence, as I just talked about, that expulsions and suspensions early in a child's education can also affect the expulsions and suspensions that happen later in school. These are practices that hinder social, emotional, and behavioral development. I mean, think about it. Those early years are those years where you're put into a setting that's supposed to be nurturing and healthy and full of experiences that contribute to a healthy development and an academic successful life. And what we are seeing, these are those times as well that children's brains are developing rapidly and experiences both positive and negative that they share with their families, caregivers, their community, 
and their schools. These early years are what set that course, what set life for the relationships and the successes that all of us experience for the rest of our lives. So it's really important, very important that those early years, that those crucial years that we truly foster and never harm their development. Unfortunately, folks, African-American boys make up 18% of preschool enrollment, but 48% of preschoolers are suspended more than once. That's almost 50%. disproportionately expelled, disproportionately suspended from these early learning settings. Um, and it's a trend that has virtually remained unchanged over the past decade. So what do you think that does to a family's experience, to a child's experience in that very first learning environment besides the environment at home that you're set in? You know, these are practices that many families encounter. These are their experiences in early childhood. And these are practices that need to be replaced with that nurture the development of our children in all of these settings. Um, Lisa talked about school resource officers and what role do they play in all of this? You know, a lot of children um, come from various socioeconomic status. They live in various communities. And a lot of children come to school um, with a lot of baggage or perhaps very little baggage. But we all bring our, our home experiences, our school experience, our community experiences to school. And as Lisa said, the role of the school resource officer really uh, accumulated, it, it expanded after Columbine. And for some people that might've looked like safety, but for others who see a person in a uniform uh, in a very negative way every day in their life, now seeing them in this place where there was safety, where they were harbored, it now looks very different. You know, schools across the country are increasingly relying on school-based officers. There's over 30,000 officers now in schools. Um, and a lot of those are police officers or security guards with a gun. And although the purpose of these was to maintain a sense of safety, the consequence, as Lisa had mentioned, has resulted in greater arrests and referrals for minor, minor disruptive behaviors with especially harsh results for girls of color. And I'm gonna throw some information out to you. According to the 2013-2014 data from the US Department of Education, black girls are 2.6 times as likely to be referred to law enforcement on the ground, school grounds as white girls. And black girls are almost four times as likely to get arrested at school. Now these disparities also affect Latinas and are especially more severe in elementary school, where they are 2.7 times more likely to be arrested than white girls. And a lot of this, you know, we've had those conversations before, um, goes back to being objectified and adulterified and thought of, of being more than who you are. These are still little girls. So of course, research shows that all of these negative school expulsions and suspensions practices are associated with negative educational and life outcomes. They influence a number of the adverse outcomes across development, health and education, where we continue to see so many disparities. Young students who are expelled or suspended are as much as 10 times more likely to drop out of high school, experience academic failure and grade retention, hold negative school attitudes, and can you wonder why, along with their parents, and face incarceration than those who are not. 
Schools are suspending students too much. And we need to find other ways. We need to change the way we treat our children, our black and brown children, from the time they enter the most crucial times of their lives, the learning environment of school. Um, now think about this. So we've talked about what happens overall, nationally, with all children. And expulsions and suspension practices also sometimes delay or they interfere, they get in the way of the process of identifying and addressing underlying issues, which may include disabilities or mental health issues. Children can go for years being undiagnosed around their specific disabilities or behavioral health issues and may be eligible for additional services or preventions that are delayed or never given. But being expelled or suspended, they may not receive the evaluations or referrals they need to obtain services. The juvenile centers as well as the adult jails are filled with young people and black young adults and black adults who have never been identified or who have um, disabilities. 85% of youth behind bars have a disability. So you think about this, um, and let me throw some of those dates out before we continue. You know, the black students that are being served under IDEA, about 16% are twice as likely to be diagnosed and placed in mental retardation programs. developmental disability, intellectual disability. Um, black students are likely, twice as likely to be identified as having emotional disturbance and intellectual disabilities as their peers. One in four black males with individual educational plans receive out of school suspensions compared to one in 10 white males with IEPs. More than one out of four boys of color with disabilities and nearly one in five girls of color with disabilities receives an out of school suspension. And most of these suspensions are not for violent behavior. So according to the Center for Civil Rights Remedies for every 100 students with disabilities, white students lost 43 days to suspension. So yes, it's an issue, but black students nearly lost three times as many days. That's 121 days for the same thing. So I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, um, you know, if your child's behavior impedes learning, um, if there's any other type of behavioral challenges, you know, that these are things and their strategies and interventions, um, including the use of positive behavioral interventions and supports um, that you can talk about and discuss when developing your IEP. There's ways to modify your IEP, to reduce the need for discipline of a child with disabilities and avoid suspension or expulsion to identify a child as needing an individual educational plan or perhaps some other type of interventions. But the true fact of the matter is that this does not always happen and it disproportionately does not happen effectively for black and brown children. So we've shared the national data and now today we're going to share our experiences about how the school disciplinary system treats black children with disabilities and their entry or not into the preschool to prison pipeline. And I'm gonna pass this over to Safir to kick off the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Monique, uh, for sharing those facts and really for framing this discussion around fact-based research and how the impact on families of black children uh, and those panelists that are on the line with us today is far beyond what is acceptable. Uh, you know, the impact is certainly adverse 
Not only does it impact a student's ability to learn or effectively access their education, but as we've already highlighted in these slides, it funnels and feeds the school to prison pipeline. And it does it in a very disproportionate way, uh, which has been made apparent by the statistics that you've shared. But I think it's also gonna be better informed, as you've mentioned, by the personal experiences that we have had and experiences that we have helped other parents navigate who have come to us for help. So from a personal perspective, my son uh, was nearly put into or, or funneled into this pipeline if there was not adequate intervention at the time of the incident. Uh, so my son again is six years old. Uh, he has autism and he's in a self-contained environment. Uh, so many of the students in his class also have autism. Of course, it's to varying degrees because as we all know, it exists as a spectrum. But my son is in a class with two boys uh, who happen to be Caucasian and they are brothers, or he was at the time. And, and during that time, I learned that he was being bullied by one of the brothers. Uh, and in fact, it had gotten so bad that uh, the other brother joined in in an effort to um, make the situation become physical. Uh, you know, the bullying had taken place you know, by way of verbal abuse. And, and there were a number of remarks that were made uh, that I was never informed about until after I began to question the type of response that the school was giving to my son, as opposed to all of the children involved in this incident. And so I was called one day, I was told to come to the school. I was asked uh, if my son had any behavioral problems at home to which I responded, no. Uh, and I was also asked um, if I uh, would consent to him being pulled out of class and, and detained essentially for the entirety of the day until I could come to the school. I made it my business to get there uh, only to learn that my son during um, a transition period in the hallway was encountered by a school resource officer pulled aside um, and was literally questioned as if he was an adult. Um, he, he was an emerging speaker at the time, so he didn't have a full grasp of the English language at that point. Um, and he couldn't answer many of the questions that he was being asked. And again, we're talking about, he's, he's six, six today, he was only four at the time. And he's being asked questions that he couldn't answer. Uh, and because he couldn't answer these questions, the, the reaction of this school resource officer uh, was really increased agitation. He was agitated because he couldn't get the responses that he desired. And, and his reaction was to criminalize my son. Um, so when I got to the school and I began to have these discussions with the officer, I demanded that he be present uh, because initially the discussion was only with the teacher uh, and, and a, a vice principal. I learned that he had endured ongoing bullying at the hands of these brothers, these two brothers in his class, and there was no response to their behavior. There was no suspension, there was no detention or questioning to the degree that my son endured. And so when I questioned them about their lack of an adequate reaction in protecting my son. Uh, it was then that I learned about that fact and, and I demanded that something be done about it. Eventually he was pulled from that school, placed elsewhere. Uh, and today we obviously find ourselves in a better scenario. But if I was not available, if I wasn't present, if I didn't demand answers, I can only imagine how this officer's agitation Right. could have escalated further beyond control and that my son would be put on a track toward imprisonment. Uh, and so it really just highlights and underscores the fact that 
school resource officers in many cases are inappropriately placed in a school building. Uh, it, you know, really, it was, it was what I would say it must result in is a shift in this mindset where we believe that an officer is required on school grounds to maintain safety. When everything that we've already brought up with these statistics and our personal experiences already tell us that an officer's presence alone, because they lack emotional intelligence training, because they lack counseling training, and because they are trained to respond in many cases with force, sometimes escalated force so that they can mitigate any potential violent situation. It's inappropriate for students to have to face that on a daily basis, especially when we're in an environment where black students are marginalized and often the recipients of unjust practices and violent responses to nonviolent behaviors. And so that's my story thus far. I certainly have more and we do have additional statistics to share as well. But what I'd like to do at this point is to turn it over to the panel so that we can begin to share some of those personal experiences and underscore how this issue really impacts us at home when it hits home for our children. Hi, good afternoon. We don't have where we are now, but I'll tell a story about what happened when we were in the Trenton Public School District. For one thing, the children were greeted outside. They were made to line up in rows and they were brought into the school by the security guards, not the teachers because contractually the teachers don't start until a certain time of the day. And as they're going into the school, their bags are searched, okay? And these were by security guards. So depending, that's the entrance for the playground where they're supposed to be playing, but they're not playing in the, play, in the playground. What they're doing is lining up like you do in a prison and you're being marched in by the security guard, yet the soon to be corrections officer into school and have their property search. So let's say they were supposedly doing a good job and yet a student bought a gun into school and decided to put it on display for lunch where there's video and a school resource officer. No one saw it except for my son because of where he was sitting and he told adults, but instead my son was vilified. My son was thought to be a liar, not telling the truth. Are you sure? Are you sure that's what you saw? We looked at the tape, but we didn't see anything. No, that's not what it is. Well, why not ask the student and the ones that my child picked out and said, yes, these are the ones that were there sitting at the table when this other student was displaying his firearm. And they said, yes, there was a gun. And then the lies now start mounting. No, it's not a gun. It was a cigarette lighter. I'm not sure if anyone still uses those, but this is what the lie turned out to be that it was a cigarette lighter. So as we talk about this, schoolyard to prison pipeline, depending on where you're living, it can look obvious or it can look not so obvious. So as we say, this started with the Columbine incident. HBO did a documentary about the Columbine incident when it occurred. And one of the things that spoke loudly to me, and it still resonates with me today, one of the officers said that he had the opportunity to take out the shooter, but he couldn't. And the reason why he couldn't was because the child looked like his child. 
So I extrapolate that to say, when they look at our children, simply because of the color of their skin, we're not even getting into special ed. And if they have a diagnosis, our children don't look like them. So they're seen to be adults. Safir shared last week that his son at four at the time was vilified for having a fork and a knife. So our children are being seen as predators when they're still babies, when they're still children. They're not seen as being believable. When my son told the principal that he saw this gun and then to be made to be a liar. So of course, as we speak about the stress that comes along with that, which is why I say our children suffer post-traumatic stress syndrome from having to deal with the educational system. Walking into the building, there's a stress because teachers don't see our children are being as worthy. Those who are making supposedly saying that they're providing resources or if they're giving this child this accommodation, modification, and then how it's begrudgingly given or I have to literally sit at a table and cry about what it is my son needs, just that you can see that my son is worthy or my daughter is worthy. This should not be, but this is the system that we live in. Right. And you sit there and you judge us and you judge our children. Can you imagine psychologically what not just our children are feeling, but what we are feeling, seeing the hurt and pain in our children's eyes on a daily basis I'm getting emotional, but I'm gonna tell you this story. I remember the exact moment that my child, my eldest child lost that flicker in her eye. I never thought I would, but I did because of the constant battling back and forth. And she was in private school. But the trauma that you all inflict upon our children, it is painful. Painful. I'm going to give it to Maria. Thank you. Right. Uh, and before Maria speaks, I just want to clarify that after Columbine, that's where they kind of ramped up the use of um, school resource officers. But even from the 1970s, there were about a hundred, roughly about a hundred SROs in schools, and today there is an estimate thirty thousand. You know and uh, school resource officers and whatever model that looks like. If it's a police officer, which is usually a community police officer, or if it's a security guard. So they can look very different. And if Safir, I think he has some information that talks about that there's more school resource officers in school than counselors. So what does that say, you know, to um, our practices? and what, who we bring in to support our children. Because I don't think that um, police officers or school resource officers are the ones that can really help children with the anxiety, with the emo social emotional problems that they may endure before or during their school careers. Uh, Maria? Thank you. Um, as someone who is a, a licensed clinician, I am always concerned about mental health, especially the mental health of our Black youth. Um, when thinking about having an SRO officer, um, a police officer in our case um, at the schools, we have to think about the racial trauma that comes with that as well. You know, there is PTSD, but there's also racial trauma, um, especially now with our children um, gearing to, up to go back into the new academic school year. Um, more than likely, uh, a high percentage of those children are going to be coming in with racial trauma. And then to see an officer um, when we know <laughs> what an officer in the community stands for when it is presented uh, to us. Um, 
to have to then go into the schools and navigate my school day and my, my academics and think about the impact of that officer also there um, and what that means to the child, we have to think about the effects on that child's mental health and what that means. Um, a lot of times we are saying, oh, the safety, the safety of the students, but we're not thinking about the safety of the black students. Um, and for the safety of the black students, we have to think about having officers that are in the schools uh, that are not culturally responsive, that do not practice culturally, uh, cultural humility, that are not trained uh, to deal with those with disabilities. You know, we, we have the so whole school staff that's probably not culturally responsive and trained. Um, so when something happens, they automatically want to bring in a SRO officer to de-escalate the situation, not knowing it's just going to in fact escalate the situation. Um, there needs to be more training on how to um, communicate effectively uh, with teachers and students within the classroom before we're bringing in an officer and thinking about the impact it has not only on the child, but the parent as well. Um, I've seen um, SRO officers, police officers bully parents as well. You know, it is not just on the, the impact of the student, but the, the families as well. I've seen this, you know, um, and thinking about bullying in general, thinking about students, no teachers as well um, bully our children, especially when it comes to black children. They're criminalizing our children just based off of the color of their skin. You know, again, like I was saying, the bar is set so high for black students, um, it's unrealistic. The children are constantly not going to reach this bar. Um, so I've had clients who had a, a their, their child in the school and the teachers were the ones that were bullying the child just based off the child being black. Um, anytime the child had an issue, uh, it was always the child's fault. So much so, so that this child developed anxiety. Right. They were constantly sending the child to the principal's office. The child would constantly have panic attacks and they began to criminalize that behavior, right? So because they're not understanding the impact of what their actions are doing, they continue with these things. So we have to think about how to start at square one and to one second, baby. Um, and to think about, you know, where we're coming with the training for our staff, because it's so important to make sure that we're not only thinking about one set of students, but how this impacts our entire group, especially our black students. Right. And we, and we have to look at discipline policies in our districts. What does that look like? You know, there's a huge movement. Zero tolerance isn't working. It's about police free schools and replacing, you know, what those officers initial, um, what they were supposed to be bringing initially. Um, so it is, it's about rethinking, you know, I am familiar with a district where this is an elementary school and they had 23 incidents that enabled them to call the police. Bypass the principal, bypass the teacher, you can call the police. You know, look at the policy. If taking a pencil off of a desk is theft, you need to rethink the language that you have around discipline policy. And for those of you that are part of a child study team or even, you know, think about the things that we are saying when you're making determinations or, or coming up with presumptions around the very people that are sitting across from you. So who'd like to share? So very true, uh, Monique, you're absolutely right. Uh, and we do have something coming from one of the panelists who will be prepared to share just after. I just wanted to interject for a moment uh, with some of the data that we have available, uh, because as you mentioned, it is also important that we underscore these experiences with the facts of, of what's already being reported nationwide. Um, Certainly our experiences matter, these children's lives matter. Uh, and so that's why this is such an important topic that we host. So as can be seen here, you know, the criminalization of children is part of the problem. It's the core, at the core of the problem. The criminalization of black children, of course, 
being further exasperated worsens that problem. Uh, as you've mentioned, Monique, four black students are four times more likely to be suspended than their white peers. And you mentioned this, but I brought it up again because it's important that we draw the correlation. Because if black students are four times more likely to be suspended than their white peers, and black girls are 10 times more likely than white girls to be suspended or to receive discipline referrals, it lends to the fact that students that are suspended, that are expelled for any discretionary violation are nearly three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system. So that means not only have these students already experienced a traumatic event in that they've been suspended from school, uh, they now have this likelihood hanging over them that they're going to enter the juvenile justice system for something that could have been avoided, something that could have been treated as a learning or opportunity or a teachable moment, as opposed to a disciplinary justification for imprisonment. And so when we talk about a school resource officer and what their role is inside of the school, it's important that we remember that they are not equipped or prepared to replace counselors, equipped or repair, prepared to replace guidance counselors or mental health counselors. They are taught to respond to threats with equal, if not more, um, violence or force to mitigate the risk from that threat. And therefore, what we've done is we have given the industrial prison complex within our country an inside track, inside access into a school so that they can continue to further the funneling into their system so that they can enhance the profits that they've already begun receiving. The fact that we've made imprisonment a profitable industry in this country and then took that profitable industry and gave it an inside access to our school system, we have for many students, especially those of color, those who are black, we have given them a sentence to a dead end. And so that is something that cannot be ignored and most certainly must be addressed. Uh, so Sharon. Thank you, Sophia. I want to share a story as Maria was talking about the trauma that our children receive. I remember after a very tough day for my son, he went through a lot um, this year too. Once he came home and said another student walked up to him, grabbed his left nipple, twisted it, and told him to suck his dick. He reported it. School said nothing wrong with that. This is how kids play today. Okay. We then called up and said, nope. Not sure what planet you're on, but that's not how children play. And there's a, you know, we all have our own personal space. And my son's space was not, it was not respected. So finally, they said they had a discussion with that student. And that was about the extent of it. But my Black son is dealing with the repercussions of this. And with teachers, as Maria said, that bully our, our children. They bully. They really do bully our children. And then it's made, that child is made to feel like that child caused the issue or he did something wrong. I remember once something happened and he came home and I asked him, well, what's wrong? How are you feeling? And this broke my heart because I want you to picture this. I want you to picture your child coming home and telling you that they feel like an animal in a cage being poked at from all sides and having nowhere to go. This is what you all do. What do I do for that? Because then I have to send him back to school the next day. I don't keep him home because if I do, I then become the problem. Well, what's wrong? He has severe anxiety now, but he's the problem. 
because he just wants to be educated. He doesn't want to be seen as less than. He learns differently, but he learns. That doesn't mean we don't treat him with respect, civility, and dignity, that which you demand from us. So when you think of putting these things in and not recognizing how it's negatively impacting our children and how you put policies in place that don't see our children as worthy or being individuals that are worth to be given the same thing you would even give your dog. You all don't see us like that. My child felt like he was an animal in a, can you imagine? having that in your head. So of course, I now have to unpack that and teach him that that's not what it is. We are constantly, constantly repairing the damage that you do to our children on a daily basis. A daily basis, we have to repair it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, and you really do highlight a significant problem uh, because not only does your son and others like him who face these issues directly have to overcome or deal with the traumatic impact that follows, but then you have those students who are onlookers who have this experience and must be given guidance and some type of therapy to overcome these issues as well because it creates an anxiety that cannot be ignored. Uh, for students in school who see that their peers, their friends, those that look just like them being mistreated and mishandled for small infractions as if they're animals or as if they're adults, they then have to walk this very fine line and they have to walk around every single day worried about whether they'll be next. That's right. And that in itself begins to dismantle any sense of hope for that child. It's already bad enough that in many of the schools near me where black boys are the least numbered in that school based on the larger population when you compare the ratio. Because you have early dropout rates, you have other externalities impacting their ability and their willingness to attend school. But then you have those who are left who want nothing more than education, success, to move on to college, to get a career, to have readiness and support. They're left thinking whether they've done something wrong or if they'll be perceived as doing something wrong so that they too can be derailed from any sense or hope of success. I'm gonna to turn to Monique for a moment so that she can talk a bit about the statistics. Uh, Monique, I'm sorry, uh, Maria, if you would. Sure, um, in, in thinking about the statistics and when we're talking about 20% uh, of, of black girls being suspend, um, being uh, the population and 54 of that percentage being a part of suspensions and 19% of, of you know, black boys and uh, 45 of them being a part of suspensions. Most of those suspensions um, are for nonviolent things. So we're talking about um, dress code, which I, I've seen a lot. We're talking about um, how the hair naturally grows out of my head. Um, that is a problem with <laughs> schools, how the hair naturally grows out of my head. And if you guys think this is not a problem, we're actually uh, passing laws in certain states to protect um, black people for how the hair uh, naturally grows out of our head. Um, these are the kind of things that we're dealing with when we're, we're bringing our, our kids to the school. Um, Again, post-secondary trauma. That's what we're talking about in the instance of I'm seeing um, my friend, my, my classmate being harassed by the school, uh, being threatened by the school. And then I, in turn, um, develop uh, post-traumatic uh, 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 symptoms because of the secondary trauma. 
you know, these, these stats, we can talk about stats all day, but when we're looking at what we are telling you and what we are experiencing, you need to listen because those are facts. If I'm coming in and I'm telling you what you are doing is harming my child, then you need to listen. Right. Okay. It doesn't need to be, well, you know, I learned this and this, we can talk textbooks all day, but applying those principles to real life is a different situation. Schools are inadequately prepared to deal with mental health. Okay. Your guidance counselor is not trained to deal with mental health. Your SROs are not trained to deal with mental health. Your teachers and staff, unless they are um, licensed clinicians or have a clinician training are not trained to deal with mental health. We have a large number of kids about to go back into this academic school year who are traumatized because they are black. And if your school is not adequately prepared to deal with that, you need to start uh, preparing now because these kids are traumatized and they're traumatized because of the actions that you are all doing, the behaviors that you are all displaying without thinking how does this impact this black child? How does this officer and his demeanor impact my child, impact the student when I'm seeing officers kill people in my community all the time? You know, we have to start thinking about those things and implying it into our school system. That's right. That's right. Indeed. Indeed. And Monique, uh, we're going to turn to you really quickly. I just want to mention one thing because Maria, you raise a very excellent point. Not only are our students criminalized for infractions that are nonviolent uh, and the response is disproportionately more severe for black students. But as you just alluded to, students, black students are also being targeted for things over which they have no control, like their hairdo, like their appearance. Uh, in the most recent example, Karen Bradford, she's a 16 year old sophomore uh, in Southeast Texas. She was sent home and suspended for coming in in January of 2020 with twists in her hair, with, with dreadlocks in her hair. And, and while we all might view this as a very ridiculous reason and attempt to justify discrimination, what we also see happening is the normalization of a reaction and a response in an adverse way for Black students. When you normalize the type of response that these schools give, the problem that exists is that other parents of non-Black students don't have as easy of an opportunity to identify with the problems that you bring up right. because it's viewed as normal, it's viewed as acceptable. And therefore, it carries forward into the workplace, it carries forward into everyday society, and then the problem just continues to get exasperated. That's right. So Monique, yeah. And that's a great segue. Thank you, Safir, to lead into, again, because this is about your individual educational plan and really listening to the experiences. And, you know, when sometimes what, what can you do different? It is about listening. It is listening to that parent or that Black advocate across the table from you and taking what they're saying to you seriously, as Maria said. But in those plans, it's about ident when you're listening to identify those areas that can be supported so that they can get off that track to that prison to pipeline, um, that school to prison pipeline. You know, it's what does that individual education plan look like? What does that transition plan look like? Safir just said all of this, the end is an adult. What is the percentage of adults that have successfully transitioned into meaningful lives. And again, whatever that life looks like. You know, when we think of transition plans, for some people that may be going to college, getting a career and driving, we hear the stories. Everybody talks about my son or daughter with autism driving and getting their license. That's all part of becoming independent. Our conversations are different about what happens when you get pulled over. The script isn't the same. We don't present a card. We don't have, they don't, they don't, the black card doesn't count. Yes. You know, so what do your transition plans look like? And even for the person that has a, that might be 
more significant on that spectrum, what does police involvement look like for them? Excellent, excellent points. And that leads us into this segue for Lisa to share uh, an encounter where through her advocacy, she intervened, uh, was able to gain many successes. And yet in some cases, in some ways, the end result was not much different for one of her clients. Lisa, if you wouldn't mind sharing, we're gonna to turn to you for that story. Right okay. Now. Um, okay, I may speak slowly because these, these are client stories. And so I'm not going to share the district or the child's name or any other identifying details, but that sometimes takes conscious thought in speaking. Um, I wanted to share two quick stories about two different situations um, I had with clients and I work mostly in Southeastern Pennsylvania and I'll leave it at that. Whoops, there's millions of people here. So, um, but it shows, I think, well, let me just tell you. Um, I had two young kids, um, one black, one white, same district, dif different buildings. Both were a single parent household. Both were kids who had unsupported needs in their IEP. IEP was inappropriate, not being followed, all that fun stuff. Um, and so both were having behaviors. Both were being, uh, it has to do with restraint and seclusion and both it was more seclusion than restraint. Um, they were both being secluded sig significantly. And while I make it a personal practice to believe children when they tell me something, because children don't tend to know things like a quiet room or I had to go to the calm down room today, they don't tend to know those things unless they are actually experiencing it. It's not something they make up. But in both cases, um, each mom had an ally at the school who was verifying this story and saying, hey, this is going on. I don't wanna lose my job, but I thought you should know this is going on. So without a doubt, we knew that both children were telling the truth when they were talking about how much they were being pulled out of the classroom and secluded. One was being held in a stairwell. They had moved his desk to a stairwell. The other, um, the building had an actual seclusion room, but they called it the, the calm down room or one, one of those other names for it. So I think as advocates, we get so wrapped up in the I and IEP and we get so wrapped up in protecting client privacy that we kind of look at our clients in silos. And now with um, a little bit of wisdom and some years on me since this happened, Here's what's different about these two scenarios, because all things considered, except for one child being black and one being white, everything else is pretty much the same. With the white child, and mom did not have a great grasp, she didn't speak great English. She didn't speak Spanish, but she didn't speak great English. Um, I don't wanna say where she was from, but, um, with, but she was white. The, when we confronted the district on all this seclusion, the district was like, no, you're lying. He's lying. He's making it up. Oh, it's the language barrier. You're not understanding him properly, you know, and they just basically tried to deny it and tried every which way to deny that they were not that they were secluding this white child for, I mean, we're talking days, hours and, and days with the black child the school kept impeccable records of exactly when the child went to the seclusion room, why he was sent there, how long he was there, who he was there with, what he was asked to do in there. So the message is, but the message was, well, he deserved it. So the district knows that secluding kids is wrong. They knew enough to lie about it with the white child but the message sent with the black child was, well, but he, it was his, his fault. And we're talking about a kid who was seven years old. Okay, so that just shows, I think, like the systemic part of the racism in that they can do two completely horrific things to two kids. 
but owning up to it with one child and denying it with another child because you know it's wrong. And I think that's where I'm starting to have my eyes open as far as what systemic racism looks like. Because when you handle those cases in isolation, you just try to get that situation fixed for that child, um, which we did. The other child, he was a child at the time, um, was just a normal teenage kid. And I, I think I should say that I've had, I've had a lot of teen clients and every single teenage girl client who I've had was already involved with police and the juvenile justice system when their parent found me. With the black teen boys, it was every client except one. But for my white clients, the opposite is true. I've never had a white teen girl who was involved in the juvenile justice system. And I've only ever had one white teen boy. Um, and this is the same districts. I mean, I only work in a handful of districts in southeastern Pennsylvania because we're so densely populated here. Um, so, you know, you can't say, oh, well, it's different districts and they handle it differently. It's the same districts. Um, but this one kid, again, had unaddressed IEP needs and we got the situation resolved. We got him an independent eval. We got him a pretty decent setup. Um, sorry, I'm trying to not identify his disability. We got him remediated to where he needed to be. We got him in a VOTEC program. He had graduated successfully. Um, I know the family. I see the stepmom around town. Like I wanna say every couple of years I run into her like at the grocery store or something. And I had run into her and she had said how well he was doing and yes, he had graduated um, and all these good things. And then a couple of years after that, I saw on TV that the Philadelphia police were looking for him. And I saw the picture on TV and you know, there was no denying that that's who this child was, who was now a young man in his twenties. Um, and anyway, he's now sitting in prison for, um, I believe he's awaiting trial for murder. And I think that what that shows is that I, advocates, you know, we can do so much and we can get a child a sufficient IEP and we can get them remediation and I can get him learning to read at, you know, his maximum potential, but all of the other baggage that this poor kid came with because his IEP hadn't been addressed and he, had, he was already in the juvenile justice system and all the systemic racist, racism issues that he faced upon graduation as far as trying to find a job and um, those kinds of things like that, you know, that they can't overcome. And um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, at the end, when I give action items, you know, mention some policies and that you all can look at and, and things in your own home districts. Um, but that's why we need to look at this from a systems point of view and not just an individual because it's individual racism, I think is like I said, it's hurtful. It's hurtful to call someone a name, we know this, but it's the systemic racism that's actually harmful. It's what's killing the young men and it's what's killing the the women with you know who are not getting adequate medical care and and ruining lives because they're put on the school to prison pipeline um so any anyway i just um i mean i have lots of other examples unfortunately that i could share but i won't um but he is one that just sticks with me often and not to make it about me um but it's it's kind of unbelievable how like Sharon said, like the damage that is done on a daily basis, it's so much to overcome that even a kid who had a supportive family and he had an advocate who went to bat for him and got a lot of his disciplinary record, you know, we got a lot of that removed and we got him into, you know, he graduated from Votech and had a trade and he could be, you know, really gainfully employed. Um, he was set up for success, but there was just too much 
already in place against him. Um, and now he's, you know, he's sitting in prison in Philadelphia. So um, anyway, I don't know how to end that because it's not really very happy. So um, I'll turn it back over to you, Safir. Yeah, Th thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing that. Um, you know, it really does continue to underscore the issues that we've all mentioned here. When you think about something as meaningful as transition planning could be, you know, it's a very significant part of an IEP for a student when they reach the age of 14 and up. It, it really highlights the need for parents of black students to incorporate things that will be foreign to other parents. Incorporate things like, you know, transitioning and preparing your child for success in areas of emotional support uh, and giving them the tools that they need to even be equipped to respond to officers, whether in the school or outside of the school. There's so many factors that have to be considered that transition planning could look like a 700 page book in the end if we were to truly address all of the different areas that structurally are set up to either diminish the ability for success for black students or to eliminate them altogether. And there's just one statistic I wanna throw on the screen and then we're gonna turn right to Cheryl Lynn. Uh, but this statistic, it really highlights the problem that we've been talking about the entire broadcast, but it, it really underscores how widespread the impact truly is. In America today, 1.6 million students attend a school that employs a law enforcement officer, but no counselor whatsoever. So that means there's no opportunity for that child's emotional needs to be met truly by an expert. No opportunity to de-escalate situations and to try and identify root causes of certain behaviors. No opportunity to empower that student with techniques to overcome the traumas that they've experienced. However, there's widespread opportunity to enter prison, widespread opportunity to face handcuffs, widespread opportunity to continue to be marginalized by a system that thrives and profits on their imprisonment. It's a shameful reality, but the fact is, it is reality. So I'm gonna to turn to Cheryl Lynn, who has also something to share. Uh, and thereafter, Lisa, I'll be coming to you for closing remarks. Cheryl Lynn. Hi, thank you. Um... I want to bring this uh, bill that's in the house right now. It's called the Push Out Act. It's uh, 5325 and it's called the Push Out Act and it's in the house now and it's to avoid these punitive unfair bases that the schools do with black girls. Yeah. Um, I became aware of it for black and brown girls because they're being basically discriminated, disciplined. I have a white girl and a black girl. Same school district. They're both treated totally different. Mm. Where with my oldest daughter, which is the light-skinned one, she automatically on a path to diploma, high school, Voltec. I can't even think of a transition for my younger daughter, my black daughter, can't even get her into the school. Can't even, in one year, she was in three schools. In a matter from September to February, she was disciplined 29 times. She was 12. When she was 10, she was a victim of an online predator. I told the school, you know what the school did? They put in her IEP, she handed out nudes. Not what really is going on. They've never addressed her trauma. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 
We're going to 10th now. My daughter wants nothing to do with school because what they have done to her, the anxiety that she feels is when she gets overwhelmed, they look at it like, oh, you're being disrespectful. No, you're crowding her. And it's not only students, it's the teachers. The teachers making comments about her appearance. I can't believe your mother lets you wear that. My daughter wears black t-shirts and black jeans. And it was a constant battle. So I hope this bill does pass because it, when you have a child who is constantly in a hostile environment, which is school and it shouldn't be, and they're disciplined over and over and reprimanded over and over to a change from one school to the other, you know what happens? That kid loses interest. That kid wants to drop out. That kid doesn't want to do anything further because the trauma you have instilled in him. The child that I knew, that child is gone. That child is gone. That's no longer the child I have. And they have these school to resource officers and metal detectors. I've it, it, it goes on and they say it's to avoid, um, you know, school shootings. But if that was the case, the perfect example is what happened in Florida. They had school resource officers. This was a kid with an IEP. The school failed them so much that it cost people their lives. Okay? They failed him. They knew he was not ready to be in to the high school. But to save money, they took him out of the therapeutic middle school, put him in the high school with no support. When it got too much, told the mother he can just go for his GED. And that's what he was doing going for his GD. So this was years, the school knew it. One of the retired clinicians at the school said, we failed Nicholas Cruz. And they sure did. Like they failed so many other kids. Right now, it's hurting our kids. And we, as a parent, have to pick up these pieces. I have it's, it gets me too emotional at this point because I see the damage that's done. And it's not all this district, this child. It's the same teachers. Both my daughters are the same teachers. They're both treated totally different. So take a look at that bill. It's been in the house since December, 2019. And it's specifically geared because of black and brown girls is to prevent them from the criminalization and push up of students from school, especially black and brown girls, as a result of the educational barriers that include discrimination. It's not just us talking about it. Yeah. It's a fact. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sherilyn. Uh, not only for sharing your experience, but also for sharing the fact that that bill uh, is currently in review. Uh, we certainly do hope that it gets passed. Uh, and of course, while we're hopeful that that takes place, we're also fully aware that while the passing is important, implementation is everything. Oversight is everything. And the destruction of these systems and these practices that are widespread that discriminate against students that are black. They have to be dismantled and that dismantlement is everything. So a few of the takeaways that we wanna leave all of the viewing audience with uh, include the fact that to truly address these systems problems that create and funnel the school to prison pipeline, we must first 
ensure that high quality early childhood programs that provide positive experiences that nurture positive learning and development are available to every student in every school. The elimination and transformation of expulsion and suspension practices for nonviolent and even violent uh, infractions. The, the, the initial response should always point back to therapies and support and positive behavior supports. Creating positive climates and focus on prevention. Developing clear and appropriate and consistent expectations and consequences to address disruptive student behaviors and to address the educators, administrators, and, and faculty members who respond to them inappropriately. Ensure fairness, equity, continuous improvement, and justice for Black students. Replacing school resource officers and the practices and policies that support them in the zero tolerance zone with counselors. We need counselors, not cops. And certainly, if you want to supplement that with safety, they should not be within the school. They should be outside of the school. They should be able to be accessible in the event that external factors come into play. However, students should not see themselves as prisoners instead of students. Review discipline policies, change the language and make it more person-centered and ensure that IEPs have clear instructions around discipline procedures for your child and for the children of those that you support if you are an advocate or a policymaker. And be sure that they do not border restraints and seclusion practices. Those have to be eliminated if we are truly to change the curve and the trajectory that we are currently on in our current state of education. That is all that I have to say on today. I'm going to turn this over to you, Lisa. And that bill that is in Congress, just so that everyone understands, is HR 5325, it's the Push Out Act of 2019. Lisa? Yep, great, Safir. Um, you and I had pretty much very similar lists as far as, you know, I know people want to walk away from this stuff with um, a couple of action items. Um, I think just keep it in the forefront of your mind if you are a school personnel or um, parent ally, that our society makes it much easier to be the bad kid instead of the dumb kid. So when you have unsupported IEP needs, it, it just starts to snowball and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're this bad kid and it's, it's kind of cool to be the bad kid. You know, there's that machismo, there's the tough guy stuff. Um, meanwhile, you know, as my client who is currently in jail, you know, he couldn't read and no one was teaching him how to read. And so he felt like the dumb kid and he fell into being the bad kid because that is so much more socially acceptable. Um, there are no bad kids, they're kids. And we need to start meeting their needs. Um, yeah, I said it earlier, you know, it's the policies that are harmful. So, you know, if you want some homework assignments, look at your school district discipline policies. Do you have a zero tolerance policy? Um, consider, you know, again, being on committees, you don't necessarily have to run for school board, but in or submitting your two cents to school board members when it's policy revision time. I know Pennsylvania has a bill that's been on again, off again, eliminating zero tolerance policies in schools. Um, it has not passed yet. If you know Blake from the Facebook group, um, Blake helped write that bill. So I'm sure she would be more than willing to, um, and then she took it upon herself to visit her state representative and say, hey, I want a zero tolerance or an anti, we never know what to call it. It's like an anti zero tolerance bill. Um, we want to, she said, you went to her rep and said, I want this, you know, will you submit it? Will you sponsor it? And she talked her, um, her state representative into sponsoring the bill and, and um, introducing the bill. So gathered a committee together to get it written and all that. 
Um, and again, I'm sure she would share the wording with it if you asked her. Um, I know my friends at I have a lot of friends out in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh public schools recently, um, I think it's up until second grade, you can no longer suspend a child until third grade or after, which isn't great. It's not, I don't think suspending eight and nine year olds is the answer, but it's a start. You know, it's a start that they got K one and two um, removed from, you can no longer suspend them. Um, so those are just the types of things that you can get involved in and, and partner with other groups. If you're a mom, I've always said, most moms just come to me with nothing more than a gut feeling. They just don't know how to define it. They know something's not going right. They know something's wrong. Their child's being bullied. Their child's being, um, a lot of times you're being called to get your child from school all the time. Um, which is a suspension, by the way, in the eyes of the law, your child was, was um, asked to leave school and his peers were not. That is a suspension. Um, it doesn't matter what they call it. Sorry, I could get on my soapbox about this stuff all day because um, I, I deal with it all day. But um, moms, if you do have that gut feeling um, that something's not going right, you know, follow it, follow that instinct and don't stop asking for help until you, you can find it because I've never once met a mom um, who's got, wasn't right. And who said, you know, my child's being bullied or it doesn't seem right that they're calling me to come get him every day um, and things like that. So um, I guess that's it. Um, I'm trying to look at my list. Look at your school's discipline policy. Um, look at, be more aware of school funding, because this is kind of um, a byproduct of public schools not being properly funded for decades. And a school resource officer makes people, some people feel safe, but it's not keeping any, it's not keeping any kids safe. Um, they don't work. They don't, you know, um, you know, work with your local school district. Oh, restorative justice. So thank you, Sophia, for bringing that up. Um, work on getting restorative justice practices introduced into your school rather than suspensions because suspensions don't work. Um, we know that there's nothing to suspensions besides pun punitive um, results. There's nothing, there's no, um, it doesn't help behavior. It doesn't help model, you know, mold behavior into better behavior. Um, all it does is reward a child who is probably unhappy being in school in the first place, and it rewards them with a few days off. And if they have an IEP and they're behind their peers, now they're even more behind because they have been given, you know, three days, five days, whatever it is. Um, and it, yeah, training to ask about training for all school staff. Um, trauma, trauma is a big one. And Trauma-informed education, that's a buzzword that's kind of going around right now. And I hope that, um, you know, introduce that into your school district, you know, get on policy committees, get on curriculum committees, um, because trauma can be healed. Um, you know, some, some of these disabilities, you know, we have them our whole lives, but people can heal from trauma and, and which is very promising. Um, did I miss anything? Now did I miss anything? Does anybody want to add anything else? Now, I will send out the list of resources again, um, including the bill. I saw someone posted it on the Facebook page, the bill that Cheryl Lynn mentioned, and there's a book that, that inspired that bill. So I will send out um, the link to the book. And that's it. Um, we hope to see you next Monday. Is next Monday mental health? Is that the one? No, it's not. Uh, I should look. I don't remember what yeah. it is. Next. Oh, next week. No, next week is um, non-English speaking parents or parents who um, are not native English speakers. Um, thank you. Yes, disability and English as a second language. So join us for that one. And thank you.